my one of the one of my drawers has handkerchiefs, and I've been looking at them lately, and thinking, man, they look worn out. And I thought, you know, it's true. They are kind of worn out. And I got this one in my pocket. So I was always like, they're a little raggedy to bring to church um, on a Sunday morning. But it's like all the tears, all the tears for um, people like Luisa and Fernanda. And then I was just tears of sadness. They're tears of, you know, companionship and being impressed, thinking of uh, the Nishikawa grandpa. Uh, I, I cried tears for people like the Flores family who I recently worked about working in the cotton fields of Texas. I learned about this family reading some wonderful published articles by Ralph, one of the five sons. Last year was pretty good for the Flores family. Uh, Daddy and the sons worked, got a job working crops for Mr. Simmons, who said, hey, you can, you can sleep in my large farmhouse. We can all live together. Unfortunately, Mr. Simmons went broke, had to sell the farm, and the Flores family had nowhere to go. After a period of homelessness with seven kids, Mr. Flores found work for his family with a new farmer, Mr. Riley, who said, well, my house is not big enough for that, but I have two large canvas tents, which you're welcome to set up on the property. So living in tents is tough in many ways that you may know or you can imagine. Wind and rain hit hard. It's Antonio and Roberto's job to go outside and make sure the stakes are secured so the tent doesn't blow up or away. And, and nights like that bring fitful sleep. Next day, breakfast, they say, is pretty quiet after a day like that because everybody's so tired they don't even want to talk. And after eating, they grab their hose, slog out through the heavy mud, and begin a day chopping cotton with their mud-encrusted hose clearing the weeds of the cotton field. Now, you could easily think that the Flores family, who do not have proper documents to be in the United States, are taking away jobs from people who do. You might say, hey, the Flores family, that's, I, I care about it, I have compassion, but they're taking away jobs from folks who legally are here and deserve a shot. That may be true, maybe not. In the summer of 2010, the United Farm Workers Union decided to directly confront what they call the myth that immigrants take our jobs. This is a union. Think of a Philly union confronting the myth of they take our job. <laughs> so, <laughs> Philly people, you can get this one. The union. Uh, organized a campaign, said, take our jobs. The Philly Electric Workers Union did not organize a campaign called Take Our Jobs. But this one did. And they invited citizens and green card holders to apply for agricultural work. Three months into the campaign, the union reported that its website, takeourjobs.org, had been visited by three million people, of which 8,600 people expressed interest in an agricultural job However, only seven people actually applied for a job. The, the reality is, in the United States, the entire current system of agriculture depends heavily on undocumented folks. As you heard in the reading that Yvonne gave, a 2010 U.S. Department of Ag report estimated over half of the agricultural labor force in the U.S. is undocumented Mexicans. Actually, it's from the same book. I'm not sure if it was in the exact reading. It is, okay. If, if the Trump plan for immigration were implemented, one small factor, and I'm not being facetious, would be prices would skyrocket. A head of lettuce, asparagus, nectarines, peaches. And still, good 
smart people, good smart people, still point out the fact that, well, okay, but some folks are here legally and some folks are here illegally, right? That's, that's a fact. I say maybe, maybe not. Dep honestly, I say how it depends on how you look at it as a smart, caring human being on the planet. Many, many aspects of the context are unclear. Let me name some important factors that I think all Americans should be aware of. In the 1840s, the United States invaded Mexico. And huge segments of land, including major sections of Texas, New Mexico, and California, were essentially stolen through war. Okay, so it, there's a saying among Mexican-American folks in Southwest US, it's not a cutesy saying, we did not cross the border, the border crossed us and our antepasados, our people, the border crossed our people. Another factor, many well-intending United States people who hold a US passport tend to think that the freedom to travel anywhere is simply the equivalent of buying a plane ticket and possibly paying a modest visa fee. And for most US citizens, that's true. But around the globe, especially people who are citizens of poor countries, it's not true. If they can get the resources together to pay a plane ticket, there's no visa being offered to be purchased because most governments, including ours, say, you're not coming to visit this place. Next factor. NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement, was implemented in 1994. I was living in Mexico when it was implemented. It create, essentially created a free trade zone in Mexico, United States, and Canada. However, the reality is, for the last 11 years, it's essentially free trade for people who have resources and capital. So really, if you're a business person in any of the three countries and you want to go develop shopping malls, in one of the other countries, you can probably do it. You, have, you can go free trade or buy products, Im, import products from there, et cetera. However, most poor folks for labor, I mean, for, um, for trade, they trade labor. So if you're a bricklayer in Mexico, you can't just come up to Philly and say, I'm setting up shop to trade my labor. No. Most people are not in on free trade. The majority of folks don't have the resources. Next factor, for many years, Mexicans and Central Americans have suffered massive violence in their communities, predominantly because of drugs, which are strongly fueled by U.S. drug consumption. The demand is predominantly in the U.S., where we will pay the dollars year after year, and yet the U.S. government rejects massive percentages of asylum requests. We're not, people shooting each other up with automatic weapons in your small town in Sonora, Mexico, it's not our problem. I don't think that's a fair way to look at it. The last decade immigration to the U.S. is down. Obama, President Obama, has deported more people than any U.S. president in history. Net immigration to the United States is at least zero at the most for the last seven to eight years. So these are not the only factors. I don't have a lot of solutions, but I know it's complicated. And I know we have to bring our best hearts and minds as fellow human beings to the conversation. We have to keep it real in offering solutions that impact undocumented folks, that in, impact people who hire undocumented folks. Think, if there's 11 to 30 million undocumented people in the United States, which is basically where the debate is, think of how many people are employing those tens of millions. The policies have to impact the people who are employing. And most importantly, our communities are communities which are enriched by people we would have never known. I'll bet you, whether you're explicitly aware of it or not, every one of us has one to 20 stories in our lives of how your life has been improved 
by immigration in the last five to ten years, whether you know the person's status or not. I, I really believe that's true. We, we should keep it real. We should join. If you care about this, get involved with you. You plan. Advocate. The federal judge ruled to close the three detention centers. The federal judge in California, she said, the, there's widespread deplorable conditions in the Burke's Detention Center, which many kids are suffering in. It's not safe. It's not sanitary. It's not right in America. That's what the judge says. We should follow through and close that detention center in our state. And still, I want to recognize that it's overwhelming. These are macro issues, big stuff. The um, last thing I did before seminary was work in Chiapas, Mexico with refugees. I was very uh, depressed and feeling disempowered. It's part of why I came to seminary to do something different to make a difference in people's lives. So we have to ask, what can we do to make a difference? What can we do? I think Hero sets a wonderful model reflecting on his family story. Each and every one of us can reflect on a family story. Now, my family story has been in the true, the Matthiases and the Levitts both came over so long ago, we really don't know the story. We're just white folks. That's what I got growing up, that's what I grew up being told. Well, what I also learned, it's true, both sides came over a long time ago, but what I've learned now is it didn't mean anything documented or undocumented. They got a ticket to a boat and came over and walked on the land and kept going. They never had to show anything to anybody. That's my family story. Okay. What's yours? Keep it alive so then we have a more realistic conversation with each other. What spiritual values for Unitarian Universalists and people of good conscience matter? For Unitarian Universalists, justice compassion and equity in human relations. How do these relate to folks involved in the harvest of our foods or the, the production of other important items we want and need in our lives? How do we apply justice, compassion, and equity to all the members of our communities where we live and work and play? When we think of immigration, we can give thanks for experiencing grace of new connections. This gives my handkerchief a break and brings joy to my heart and a smile to my face. With immigration, whether we're receiving folks or going somewhere, we cross previously entrenched social, cultural, language, economic barriers. With folks we would have never known before, we learn, share, help, persevere, celebrate the small things in life. I believe this with all my heart. And um, Philadelphia is so much better off with rising immigration rates than it was before. Used to, first one thing, it used to be so entrenched, and it still is 45% black, 45% white. Now we have new people from all over the globe, Africa, Latin America, Asia, and it's just more of a mix of cultures and languages and traditions and festivals. And then we can go deeper with each other, shared values. Oh my gosh, we can do better on helping the kids in the playground have no guns and no drugs in the playground, because we all care about that. Our children together, we can, can dream about following their talents in the new careers and jobs. We can help each other's kids to study. We can mow each other's lawns. We can have summer barbecues and dance all night at weddings. We can have holy days and holidays, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Day of the Dead, Diwali, Kwanzaa. Together, we celebrate life. Together, we are building beloved community with compassion, service, and empowerment. Blessings be Amen. Let us join together in singing hymn 1017.